Hi there, and welcome back to my channel. My name's Holly, and I'm an animal illustrator. Today we're going to be talking about a couple of different things. So we're going to be talking about fear of the first page, you know, starting that new sketchbook and how to sort of get around the anxiety that comes with that as well as um, talking about the animal itself. Today I'm going to be focusing on the southern ground hornbill, particularly the males, just for cohesion in this particular spread, because the, the ladies look a little different, so boys are back in town today. And I'm also going to be talking a bit about how I use paint pens. So let's start off with talking about fear of the first page. It's quite a common feeling if you or anyone you know at home draws. That thing of like staring at a blank piece of paper and going, oh my god, what do I draw? Like, I don't know what to draw or getting distracted and being like, oh, I've got dinner on or... I need to do the laundry or I don't have the time. These kind of things sort of spiral through any artist's head at some point or another, but I feel like it's particularly bad with the first page of a sketchbook. It's really intimidating and I think everyone's gone through it at some point or another. I myself am particularly bad for that sort of thing. I have a really, really, really bad habit of starting in the first double page spread of a sketchbook and not the actual inside cover because it gives me that much anxiety. But I think I found a way to sort of get around that. So my new favourite thing, and this is exactly what has happened in today's video, is just picking something vaguely in my wheelhouse, so in this case birds are something that I'm quite good at drawing, and just choosing the most horrendous looking <laughs> bird possible to draw. And it worked really well! I'm actually really happy with how it went, because it took all the fear out of it. I think um, a lot of that spiral comes from putting pressure on yourself, or at least it does for me, for sure. I know for a fact that doing it this way took all the pressure off because if I was drawing something small and cute and had to be, you know, a somewhat perfect shape, it would add a lot of pressure to what I was doing because I'd be focusing too much on making it perfect. Whereas with a bird like this, as you'll see later on in the video, <laughs> they are like 80% tumours <laughs> in the face. They are just lumps on lumps on lumps on lumps. Their eyes are lumps, their cheeks are lumps, they have one hell of a gullet. And it means that, A, it's really fun to draw for me as someone that loves texture, but there's kind of no wrong way to draw them, because they're already weird looking. So if I do a weird drawing, it actually kind of goes hand in hand. And I think if you're at home and you're struggling to pick something to draw, say if you do human portraits as an example, maybe just choose someone that's really unusual looking, so maybe pick someone that is very wrinkly or has an unusual sort of facial structure. If you're drawing like landscapes, maybe choose like a horrifically lumpy hill, I don't know. You can kind of use it as a rule of thumb to make it work for you and it just takes all the pressure off. So let's talk about the southern ground hornbill next. Southern ground hornbill is one of two species of hornbill, both of which are found in Africa. I may do another video and do the other species on the actual inside of the cover, but today we're talking about the southern one. Uh, 
they're mostly found in Kenya, but they are found in other parts of South Africa. They're one of the big six, which is the sort of six amazing species of birds found in Africa, and particularly in captivity. And as far as the IUCN list goes, as of 2018, they have been listed as endangered in South Africa and vulnerable globally. If you want to hear me talk about more of this stuff in another video, let me know down below in the comments because I could talk about this stuff for hours. I'm not going to today. <laughs> But just to rattle off some of the reasons why they are in this sort of situation, it's mainly persecution and habitat destruction. They are also very slow breeders, so these two other factors play into their ability to breed. They tend to sort of group in five or six of them. So you can imagine if it takes them a long time to breed, they don't live in large groups, and they're competing with the human factors as well. You can see why they are in that situation. They are a carnivorous bird. So, like a lot of large birds, they also feed on smaller birds, as well as snakes, other small reptiles, and larger insects. So, particularly things like snails and crickets and stuff like that. And I'd highly recommend that after you watch this video, like and subscribe, you go and Google a southern ground hornbill call. It is the weirdest noise. If I try and replicate it, it kind of sounds like how or like a horn or something. And it's kind of impressive. They're sort of a gullet, if you will in flights quite large when they are talking to each other as well as kind of something worth watching if you like birds. They are also quite heavily featured in certain parts of South African culture. They're often considered to be sort of warning signs of death, but also I think it's kind of interesting. If they're seen and heard doing that kind of noise in the morning, it's meant to sort of represent the rain coming. And they're seen as sort of birds that sort of conjure rain in certain cultures in South Africa. So size-wise, the males average between about a meter to a meter thirty when they're fully grown. So they're big birds, they're not chickens, and the females are only slightly smaller than that. They're quite hefty, they weigh about 4.6 kilograms in general across both male and female, and the only sort of major difference between the girls and the boys is the boys have a more prominent horn, hence the name hornbill, and are mostly red to reddy pink in colouring as far as the fleshy parts of their face go. The girls have more of a blue hue and they tend to not have the actual horn part, or at least not as much of a prominent one on their face. Painting wise, I did a couple of different things uh, on this page. I did a little cross hatching, Mostly, I kind of just blobbed it on and hoped for the best. I am more of a pen and ink kind of person than an acrylic painter. It's not my sort of chosen thing to do. Um, one of the things that I found worked really well on this, because there was a base of acrylic paint down anyway, is I would sort of use the paint pens that I had to kind of roughly sketch on an area that needed like highlights or a bit of pink or you know just some different color and I'd actually just finger paint it on so I used my finger to blend it out and it worked really well. I don't know how well that would work if you were using much more contrasting colors so I wouldn't recommend it for everything 
but it actually worked quite well to blend them out for this because I didn't want to use just acrylic paint on everything because I'm impatient and like I said, it's not my favourite thing to use. <laughs> So for a lot of the hair detail, I ended up going back in with black. You could kind of see in the previous clip that I'd started going in with a lighter grey to kind of do the opposite of what I would normally do in a pen and ink drawing, which is draw the highlights of the hair rather than the shadows. I realised about halfway through, because I did a lot of work off camera because I was getting stressed out, <laughs> that um, it, it wasn't giving it enough depth for me. I like really high contrast, deep textury hair and particularly because hornbills, at least on their sort of head, areas that are visible in this spread don't have a lot of individual hair texture, so like individual fully formed feathers. I found this actually worked really well and so the grey that I initially laid down ended up being more of a mid-tone. After a while, I ended up working on the sort of mid-level texture of all the sort of tumory lumps with another red because I realised that when all this black was eventually going to be placed down, I kind of wanted the red to be underlying, so that when I go back in and do the outline later on, the black can cover certain parts of it or reinforce certain parts of it. And um, particularly because they have a, a really testicle <laughs> texture, as you can see right now, this worked particularly well. To get those sort of creases, but not cracks, I needed that sort of middle colour that wasn't harsh, harsh black, because otherwise the whole thing was going to be thrown off, especially because I wasn't outlining every single part. I have a lot of fun with animals like this that have lots of round texture. It's really enjoyable to draw for me. That's something else to keep in mind if you're doing stuff like this that involves maybe putting yourself out of your comfort zone, but not too much. <laughs> For outlining stuff, I had a bit of an issue with these pens. I'll list everything in the description below that I'm using. This pack overall, I quite enjoy. It's a cheap pack off Amazon that I just got purely to have some more pastel colours for my overall paint pen collection. And I've found that at the moment, I'm actually using them more than my Bosco pens because <laughs> I like the nibs on them. But because I've been using them so much, the chisel end of the black has got a tiny little splint in it that doesn't quite sit with the rest of it and it works really well for hair texture but I found myself having to kind of continuously go over certain parts of it or neaten things up at the end because it had that little sort of like double line thing going on Otherwise, though, these work great, and I'll be honest, in a way, it's kind of good because it, it gets me not just doing OCD level, <laughs> like, even thickness lines and sort of mixing it up a bit, which is good for me because that is heavily, heavily in my comfort zone. I love really neat, almost overly detailed stuff that is very sort of precision-based. This sketchbook page was actually quite good for making me sort of mess around with stuff more, particularly with the paint.
one of my favorite things to do is outlining. I love, love, love outlining stuff, especially with manual stuff like this, where you're laying down stuff and building things up for ages and ages and ages. I feel like it just really pulls everything together and suddenly everything goes from looking like splurgy red and grey potatoes in this case <laughs> to looking like actual birds. And I find it very satisfying, you know. Um, I think black is just one of those universal colours that kind of, or, well, lack of colour, that kind of ties everything together. I know it's quite popular nowadays to use other colours instead of black, but I gotta admit, I'm a sucker for just, like, a cartoony, traditional, hard outline. I don't think you can beat it myself, but I just, I don't find that contrast level from other colours in the same way for what I do at least. So as I went through the process of doing the drawing, I found that I ended up sort of redefining the shapes constantly, so I'd define it with like the orange and stuff with the highlights, and then I'd end up changing it slightly with the red, and then what I'm doing now is kind of reinforcing the shapes I want to keep with black. This is the turning point in the video where everything starts coming together. <laughs> uh, for some reason, adding these little white dots change things from looking like they're just a, a flat drawing to looking 3D suddenly. Particularly eye highlights, which in my personal work I like to do kind of cartoony highlights on everything. I just find it makes things look more alive, and if you don't have it, everything looks a little dull, or dead, or weird. And particularly in this, because I'm using a lot of very similar colours, so like orange, red, and pink. Not a lot of contrast in ones. The white combined with the black especially, really pushed certain things like the eyelids and stuff into the foreground and made all the stuff that I wanted to recede and some mistakes that I had, <laughs> you know, disappear, which is really cool. Um, are these birds this shiny in nature? Probably not. I wouldn't say so. They're actually quite matte, but I don't know, something about drawing with paint pens this way, I really enjoy just slapping on some white. Hot tip, if you're using white paint pens at home, or gel pens, this works as well, you'll see that I'm kind of not pushing very hard on the paper when I'm putting the things down, so like dots or hatches or whatever. Reason being, if you can get the paint to pull up in the tip of the pen, it will lay down more opaque. So if you're struggling to get your whites to stand out, if they're kind of just absorbing the colour underneath, you may need to go in with a second layer, or just not push as hard with your pen. You can use that to your advantage though. I've found in things that I've done in the past, so if you follow me online, like the Pantone set that I've done, you can actually use it to get sort of like middle tones. And if you're using the more watered down version, especially with Posca pens, you hit a stage where the paint gets watery. <laughs> you can use it to sort of absorb whatever colour is underneath. And that can actually work in your favour sometimes. 
I was going to use a paint pen for this last bit for eyelashes. I realized it was kind of way too thick for the majority of the birds on the page. So I'm just using a Micron Fineliner in 0.05. So for the close-up study of the bird's eyeball, they have really defined pores where the eyelashes come out on the bottom lash. And I just slammed them in because I, I'll be honest, I was running out of energy <laughs> at this point and they're not perfectly spaced anyway. And I ended up going back to the paint pen for this because, you know, it's a close-up. So it, it doesn't need to be as fine in the same way. And also it was kind of the perfect thickness for these little lashes on the bottom row. So for those of you that were wondering, this is a cast art sketchbook. It was a pack of three. Uh, one being black, the other two grayscale. And this is the final page. I'm pretty happy with how it's turned out overall. There was a bit of an incident trying to get rid of some black here, but I feel like it adds character, so I'm just leaving it in for now. And I thought I did a great job at not getting paint everywhere, but somehow I managed to get it all over the inside cover. So we're going to deal with that at another time. Overall, pretty happy with how it's turned out. I mean, it's a bunch of birds, so I'm instantly going to be happy with it anyway. And just for myself, I'm going to be putting the sort of Latin family names and stuff like that in this sketchbook because it's sort of a, a weird pastime of mine. I'm trying to teach myself Latin specifically for animal names because it makes me feel like a scientist. And yeah, that, that's the whole sketch. I'm thinking for these pages in here, maybe for another video if you'd like to see that, we're doing a golden snub-nosed monkey on this one and a couple of studies of a black snub-nosed monkey. But if you have any weird looking animals that you'd like to see me draw, let me know in the comments below. I do read all of the comments on my stuff, whether it's on Instagram, YouTube, or otherwise. And I do take suggestions. The weirder, the better. Thank you for watching.